Dr. Don Crum is here with us tonight. I really prayed about who to invite in for this meeting. You'll be hearing me most all year. But I believe he holds a key to where we're going as an ecclesia. Not just regionally, but nationally as an as a ecclesia to the nation. What the call of this region has, and he's going to share, I believe, some very key things for us tonight. I don't know all that he's going to share, but I do know some. He served several presidents, every president back to, to Bush, right? The last four presidents, he served them uh, in the FBI. He's still an FBI guy. He's one of the good guys in the FBI, and uh, we're very thankful for him. He's going to share some things with you tonight that's probably going to blow your mind. And uh, are you ready for your mind to be blown? Yes. Amen. If it runs out your ear, just pick it up, put it right back in there. It'll be all right. Uh, but we're in a time that's very strategic, and we need strategy to forge ahead. Amen. Amen. You are part of the remnant. All of you in this room watching tonight, you are part of the remnant church of the Most High God. And God's getting ready to use you in some really phenomenal ways. So I'm gonna, if he wants you to know anything else about him, I'll let him tell you. Because if I told you anymore, he might shoot me, have to kill me before he got out of the room. He'll give you some unclassified stuff. Would y'all just stand and give Dr. Don Crum a really big hand as he comes tonight. Amen. Thank you, brother. You want this? Or you want that? Okay. Take your liberty. Thank you, Dr. Hood. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. God is so good. Amen. Uh, welcome to this gathering at the end of the year, the beginning of a new year. God sets all things into times and seasons in the earth and in our life. So we're moving into a whole new season. Now, I'm not going to come in here and lie to you and tell you that the year 2024 is going to be glorious, wonderful, prosperous because that's not going to happen. It's going to be our most challenging year so far. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But it's going to mean that you and I are going to have to have an access to heaven and to the Lord himself like never before because times are going to get rough. They have to. The enemy knows his days are numbered. He knows uh, and those that he is using know their time is is running out and so they have to do something to retain power and control so it's, it's going to be a turbulent year but it is going to be a glorious year for those whose eyes are fixed upon the Lord Amen. I encourage you to get as close to God as you've ever been and uh, the Psalm 91 verse 1 is the verse of the day he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You have to be close to someone for their shadow to fall over you. And even Peter had enough power in his own shadow that it healed the sick. But God wants us to come under his shadow, the shadow of his protection, his provision, his presence, his favor, all of the great things of benefit in serving the Lord he has within his shadow, but you've got to dwell in the secret place in order to qualify to become beneficiary to being under the shadow of the Most High. So we cannot afford to go along happy-go-lucky as business as usual. This is an unusual day, an unusual season. That shouldn't scare you, but it should give you faith and hope that our best days are ahead. I firmly believe America's best days are still ahead of us and not behind us. And I have good reason to believe that. Uh, not long ago, I, <clears throat> I was in southern Illinois and uh, go on our way to speak in uh, University of Southern Illinois in Carbondale, Illinois. And young lady in the back row, Becca, Thorpe, uh, her dad, I've watched her grow up uh, uh, through the years. She's like a spiritual daughter to us. 
the, her dad, Pastor Edney Nonan, was driving me in his car to Carbondale from Raleigh, Illinois. And uh, I said to Ed, I said, I heard that you have a lot of deer here, so you drive and I'm going to watch for deer. <laughs> and if I say deer 11 o'clock, that means a deer is on the left side of the road possibly coming out. Deer 12 o'clock is straight ahead. Deer, you know, 1 o'clock is to the right. Now, I'm, I'm on deer watch. I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and uh, Becca's dad is driving. And I see movement at the 11 o'clock position, and I shout to Ed, deer, 11 o'clock. And he gets on the brakes and slows way down, which is what he's supposed to do. And the closer we got, we realized it wasn't a deer, but it was an eagle, a bald eagle standing along the side of the road like he was waiting on a bus. And we both assumed the eagle would fly off the closer we got. And as we got right up beside this eagle, we were within 20 feet of this eagle that was standing there watching us and never flew away. I made a mental note of that, and I said, Lord, that's unusual. He said, yes, I caused this to happen to signal you that the eagle is sick. Because that was the only thing we could really conclude was it was either sick or wounded. And you know, the symbol of America is the eagle. It speaks of majesty and power and, and, uh, and good things, right? But to be honest with you, the eagle has fallen in America. The eagle is sick. But yet God is going to restore the dignity of America again. And I don't mean restore national pride. We don't need to have our pride restored. We need to be a nation that is humble before God, just like our founding fathers intended it to always be, but that our, our dignity and our purpose and destiny could be restored. So the Lord is restoring and is going to restore the eagle that has fallen and that is sick. Amen? Now... Tonight I'm going to share some things with you. First of all, let me put you at ease. I'm not going to tell you anything classified. I could go to prison for that. <clears throat> and probably some good folks at the FBI are watching online tonight to make sure that I don't do that. But I will share some sensitive things to you that are either unclassified or declassified. So declassified means certain situations where they were classified at a time, but they reach a, a demarcation of being dis declassified. So I know what to tell you and what not to tell you, okay? But I am going to tell you some things that you probably have never heard before. And here's why I'm going to do this, because I believe God is expecting a whole lot more out of us in this hour. And I think part of his expectation of the ecclesia is that we get better at something that I call strategic assessment. Strategic assessment is that which leads you to tactical advancement. I talked about that today to another group in this room. Strategic assessment always leads to tactical advancement. Tactical advancement is being able to advance in the time of the greatest resistance and the greatest opposition. Because, frankly, we can all advance spiritually when everything's going well, when there's no resistance. That's just called advancing. But tactical advancement is being able to move forward when there's the greatest resistance and the greatest opposition. But the key to advancing tactically is to have a better sense of strategic assessment. That means evaluating things not based on what you see or especially on what you're told. Because the internet is full of not just misinformation, but disinformation. This information is intentionally crafted information to get you to reach a wrong conclusion based on false information. And governments use it all the time, including our own. And so you can't believe everything you're being told. In fact, most of what you're being told you cannot believe in. So what we must do is begin to be more strategic in our assessment. 
And the best guarantee of getting the right conclusion and opinion is to make sure you're so close to God that you know his heart and his perspective. Because in the secret place, Psalm 91 one says, he that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So dwelling in the secret place is the condition to the promise of abiding under the shadow, shadow of his protection, his provision, his favor, his presence, all the good things of the kingdom. But the condition is to dwell in the secret place. In the Hebrew language there, the word dwell means to sit and stay a while. God needs you and me to sit and stay a while. I like fast food drive through I go to McDonald's in the morning and I order my usual, you know, egg and cheese sausage sandwich and my coffee. And from the moment I put in my order at the speaker to the moment I pick it up at the window is less than two minutes. That's fast. But I hate to tell you, God does not operate a fast food drive through franchise. You need to begin to carve out time for God every day and sit and stay a while with him. Amen? Because it's in the secret place he shares his secrets that you're not going to find any other place. We're going to come into turbulent times where you're going to depend upon what you hear in the secret place with the Lord. And I dare say that it could be that our life might depend upon our ability to hear from the Lord right here in the good old U.S. of A. And I tell you, there's a lot of places in the world tonight that that's already true. In China, if you don't hear from the Lord, it could cost you your life. God wants us to hear carefully, clearly, so that when he says, go here this day, don't go here, and he'll give you step-by-step -step intelligence on what to do and what not to do. Right. Amen? Amen? And sometimes he will lead you to do even that which doesn't seem logical yeah. or rational. Right. You know, my service in the government began over 22 years ago. And let me give you a little background on who, who I am and what I've, what I've been doing. So if you read my biographical information online about this gathering, uh, you got the cover story. And you got the generic, unclassified, unrestrict, unrestricted version. But what I've also done that wasn't posted in that bio is after the attack of 9-11, President George W. Bush did what every U.S. president can do during a time of crisis and national emergency. He signed an executive order for a special circumstance to bring people into government that had a special skill or knowledge specific to that emergency. Just happened to be I had a little of that because I have an expertise in Islam as a culture and religion. So the FBI Counterterrorism Division learned that I had lived in an Islamic nation, my wife and I raised our children in an Islamic nation, and that I understood the culture and religion of Islam. So I was invited to come in on President George's, George Bush's signature and serve as an advisor on that subject. And that began to unfold into an advisory role even directly with the White House. Uh, it was a very uh, unusual window that opened to me. It had to be authorized by the president, by the director of the CIA, who was George Tenet at the time, by the director of the FBI, who was, interestingly, Robert Mueller, and also by the attorney general of the United States, John Ashcroft. I came in on those four signatures to serve what I thought would be a two-week little fun thing to do and ended up 22 years later I'm still doing that but it has afforded me opportunity to not just serve my nation but also to learn the kingdom application of kingdom authority into civil government matters you see because the Lord's really trying to get us 
out of a congregational mentality and bring us into a congressional understanding. That's what the ecclesia is, and you've been taught well here. The ecclesia literally means called out ones who will govern with authority. That's the ecclesia. We are government officials to serve the kingdom, which is a government. God's kingdom is a government. It has a capital called heaven and a seat and throne called the throne of God. And so we are not to be locked into a religious mentality as a congregation, but we're to move into a congressional understanding of governmental authority. And you have more authority than you think you do. Uh, in July of this year, I was called into a briefing that actually, interestingly, had direct to do with what's going on in Israel right now. That was July the 8th. So we knew the attack of October 7th was coming. We didn't know the exact moment or even the exact day, but we knew what Hamas was planning uh, long before it happened. And I promise you that the Mossad of Israel knew it was going to happen way longer than our U.S. government did. But I was in this briefing. I was looking forward to it. Uh, because I had been engaged in national security matters, not just of the United States, but many of our allied nations, including Israel. Spent a lot of time in Israel, briefing the government of Israel on their national security to keep them safe from regional threats. So in this briefing, I knew who were going to be in the briefing, and we were going to be gathered in a room, a briefing room, but hooked up telephonically to military leaders in the Middle East of some of our allied nations. But in the room itself, I was looking forward to seeing a general that I had not seen in quite a while that I had become friends with and was, was involved in different governmental situations with this particular general and uh, working on some specific operations for national security. And I was looking forward to seeing the general. And we're friends and colleagues, and, and every time we've seen each other, we, our routine is to go up and give each other a, a handshake and then a man hug, right? Handshake, man hug. That's our routine of greeting each other. So I'm in the conference room, looking at the door, waiting for the general to arrive. He walks in. I stood up, and I started walking toward him. I had my hand out to shake his hand and give him the man hug. And about seven feet from me, he came to snap attention and initiated a salute to me and held that salute until I returned it, and then he went at ease. And then we shook hands and gave each other the man hug. And then we sat down and had a, probably a three-hour briefing. The Holy Spirit said, did you notice the general did something you'd never seen him do before? In all the years of probably 18 years that I've known him, he had never done that before. He had a demeanor on his face. He was serious. I think he was feeling the gravity of what was about to happen in Israel. But here's what the Lord said. He said, I did that to remind you, you have more authority than you think you do. Because any of you that have served in military know that what the general did was really the opposite of normal military protocol. Because if, if you are a lower rank and you come into the presence of a superior officer, it's your position to go to attention and snap that salute and hold it until that superior officer returns the salute. And then if he puts you at ease, then you can break the salute. So the general was doing something very unusual. But it was God's way of reminding me as we're about to go into this special season of dealing with enemy nations that are threatening Israel, he was reminding me, you have more authority than you think you do. And I want to pass that admonition over to you tonight. You have much more authority than you think you do. 
And I call it blood authority because the same blood Jesus shed to get you saved, to get you into heaven, also authorized you, deputized you, and officialized you with all the authority of heaven. The same blood that saved you gave you a position of authority. And he intends for you to spend that currency of that authority that cost Jesus his blood and to adjudicate the righteousness of God's plan and destiny into the earth. We have authority to even stop wars that are out of season. You know, every and Greg's former law enforcement and any, anybody else in the room understands this, that when you have a major incident, you always have an incident commander because you've got multiple agencies coming in, rolling up on the scene, and you know when you get there, the first thing you want to do is find the incident commander, and you want to report to that commander. Same in the military, right? When you come into a situation, you want to find the superior officer in command and report. God wants you and me to be the first responders that roll up on the scene of everything darkness is trying to do and to take command authority. That's who we are. That's what the ecclesia does. We roll up. In the critical moment when it looks like the devil might just get away with this. And we come in and we stop it. Not so much by what we do or say as much as what we believe about who we are. You see, I tell pastors all over the world, I say, pastors, you will be successful if you believe two things. Number one, believe in the God who is in you. But number two is equally as important, believe who you are in God. Because anybody can believe who God is in us, but our breakdown and our failure is often in believing of who we are in God by identity that was given to us by that blood of the Son of God. So don't, don't allow the precious blood, the royal blood of Jesus, to just be that that gets you to heaven. To me, that's a tragedy when God intended the same blood to save you also gives you authority to operate in the earth in this hour as the king and priest he says you are. Amen? So one of the challenges of 2024 is, are we going to rise up into a, a congressional understanding to adjudicate righteousness in the earth and to preempt darkness from winning the day? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen? So I want to share with you about several things tonight, but I, I, the most important thing I feel like the Lord's given me is to give you a timeline of when darkness got its greatest uh, advantage in America. There was a moment when the enemy got a foothold and an advantage in America. And I'm going to tell you when it happened. Because if you understand where the enemy got his advantage and how it happened, then you have the equipment of knowledge and revelation to do something about it. So are you ready? Buckle up, buttercup, because I'm going to tell you what you probably have never heard before. In the 1950s and 1960s, the Soviets had begun to, to deal with occultic practices called remote viewing and astral projection techniques. And they got so good at it that their operators, their agents, could literally astral project themselves from Moscow to Washington, D.C., and stand behind and overlook the shoulders of generals and read classified information, go back into their bodies and report word for word what they read to their superiors. 
This began to happen in the mid-50s all the way through the 60s. We became aware of a hemorrhaging of intelligence that was falling into the hands of the Soviets. Now, some were caught, some were arrested for spy espionage activity, but a lot of this intelligence the Soviets were getting was coming through this supernatural occultic practice they were using against America. You know what we should have done? When we learned of this operation by the Soviets, we should have humbled ourselves before God, repented, and asked God to show us a righteous reaction and response to a satanic occultic program the Soviets were using against us. But you know what we did? We didn't do that. We should have done that. But w instead, we did what the U.S. government often does. Whatever the Russians can do, we can do better. And so in the late 60s, we began the same countermeasure program to use against the Soviets under the code name Project Stargate. Project Stargate was a U.S. attempt to outdo the Soviets using astral projection remote viewing techniques for the purpose of intelligence gathering. Now, as I told you earlier, I'm not going to tell you anything classified. It's all declassified, and you can do a search on Project Stargate and read all about it. And there's a lot on the Internet about it. I'm going to tell you aspects of it that you won't find on the Internet. Stargate ran under the program name Project Stargate and also ran under other program names called Project Grill Flame, Project Sunstreak, uh, Project Looking Glass. But all of these programs were using satanic techniques by psychics that our government and your taxpayer dollars paid for. For 23 years, this was an operation, it was what we call a joint agency operation. And it was done by two agencies of our government. The DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the intelligence arm of our military apparatus, and the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA was the lead agency on the program in the beginning. So they are the ones, the DIA and the CIA, secretly, and it was highly classified in its day. Uh, I, can we see the picture of that uh, old building that I sent you? This was the original building that housed Project Stargate. It was an old barren, uh, abandoned barracks on the backside of Fort Meade, just outside of Washington, D.C. This was where they secretly carried out Project Stargate. And what they would do is they would bring these people who were psychics, occultists, into this room, put them, swore them under oath of secrecy, and they would give them a big pot of coffee whatever it took, and they would conjure up demonic powers which was necessary in order to operate in these remote view astral projection techniques. Amen? Some of you who have a background in the occult understand those terms. But this was the government's attempt to use those methods for the purpose of national security, right? So what happened was this program lasted 23 years with a ceiling success rate of 15.7%, which is not that impressive. Because what these guys would do, they were given some hard intelligence, they would be given certain information, and then they would be uh, commissioned to go in the spirit world to fill in the blanks and to get all the information they could supernaturally. 
and that was only accurate 15.7% in the whole duration of the 23-year tenure, uh, which is not very good. In fact, you and I could guess almost as better uh, or equal to that. Why did it last 23 years? I don't know any government program that would be funded for 23 years that can't do any better than 15.7% other than the fact Satan kept the gate open. Isn't it interesting the original name was Project Star Gate? I think he kept it funded, though it couldn't produce any better than 15.7% accuracy because the devil wanted to keep the gate open. Yeah. Now, the operators would, in this building, they put them in seats or chairs that looked like dental chairs with straps, and they strapped them in. The reason they did that is because when these operators would go into the spirit world, they would literally come into face-to-face -face contact with demon power that were horrific and terrifying. And they would want to get up and run out of the building. This was a classified program. They can't have people running through Fort Meade uh, going crazy, so they strapped them in, in these seats. So what ended up happening, and I'll tell you the real clincher of the whole thing in a minute, but can you imagine what entities of darkness were come in contact with by these operators. Some of those men and women lost their minds in this building and never recovered. They would go crazy and take, they would go and be taken to Fort, um, to um, Walter Reed Hospital for treatment and some recovered but others never recovered and were never seen again because of the frightening experience of coming face to face with demonic power. But nobody else in the room could see them but the operators, right? So, I came to work November the 6th, 2001, after the attack of 9-11, and uh, I'm in a briefing with a federal government agency, I won't mention it by name, but I'm in this briefing, it had nothing to do with Project Stargate, but I'd come to become a friend of one of the officials that was in the briefing. So after the briefing was over, he and I were sitting around afterwards just talking, and I had come to know that he knew the Lord. And so we had that in common. And I looked across the table and I said, did you ever hear of Project Stargate? And he kind of paused and he thought, was that where we hired the psychics to do the astral projection stuff? And I said, yeah. I said, can you, do you understand the implications of that? That our government paid a cultist to go into the spirit world to come in contact with demons, I said, that opened a massive gate over America. And I, he said, you know, I think you're right. And I said, you know what we should have done? We should have found some credible prophetic voices, which there are some, and I said, I know some of them personally. I said, because in the Old Testament, when, Israel, when the king of Israel listened to the prophets, the nation remained safe from its regional enemies. I said, there are prophets today on the planet who can hear from God, and there is a national security application of the prophetic gift to keep America safe. But we blundered drastically by tapping into the wrong side of the spirit realm. And I said, I think it brought a curse on America. The guy agreed with me as a believer. Three weeks later, I get a call from the same official. He says, can you come by the office? And so I go up there, and uh, I go into a, a room, a conference room, and, and uh, he said, remember three weeks ago we were talking about the psychics, Project Stargate? And I said, yeah. 
He said, when you left the office three weeks ago, I couldn't stop thinking about that. And how that you said God used the prophets of the Old Testament to speak to the kings of Israel, that when the kings listened to the prophets, the nation remained blessed and safe. And he said, I even got on the phone and I talked up the chain of command all the way to Washington, D.C., and somebody up the chain of command, he never told me who it was, but it was at the Hoover Building in D.C. He said, somebody found that to be fascinating, and they want you to head up an experimental program <laughs> to show us what that would look like. I'm going, me? <laughs> And he said, yeah, you, because you're the guy that told us what spiritual implications came about by our government engaging in this kind of occultic activity. So somebody up the chain of command wants you to head up the pilot experimental program. You can call it whatever you want, but those prophets that you say you know, you can recruit them onto a team, and here's what we'll do. We will, we will give your team some hard intelligence, natural information, and we'll ask your team to go to the Lord in prayer and get intel from God to fill in the blanks. In other words, to accomplish what the old Project Stargate tried to accomplish, but with righteousness instead of evil. And I walk out of that building that day, and I'm going, wow. <laughs> now what do I do? First thing I did, I called Jim Hodges, my spiritual father, and said, Brother Jim, I need help bad. <laughs> First of all, tell me who the credible prophetic voices are. This was way back in 2002, right? And so we got Chuck on the team. We got Dutch on the team. Rick Joyner came on the team. Paul Kane came on the team. Uh, Kim Clement served on the team. We had about 25 or 30 real credible prophetic voices. Got some of uh, Bill Hammond's. You mentioned uh, Tom and Jane Hammond. We got some of their folks from Christian International down in Florida to serve on the team. What we tried to do was get a representation of all the prophetic streams, not all from one stream, but we got the, you know, the Chuck Pierce stream, Glory of Zion, we got the IHOP, the, you know, out of Kansas City, got some of those guys on the team. We tried to gather, and we ended up with a team of about 30. Some were known, but others were not known at all. But yet they heard from the Lord. And so we started operating what we called Project Morning Star originally. It went through program change names. We, we ran it Project Morning Star, then we uh, went to Project uh, Swift Justice, Project uh, uh, John, help me out. What were, what were some of the other program names? Project Rolling Thunder, and the latest is Project White Stone. So our, our uh, team operated uh, under those four program names. Now, one day I was, after running the program for several months, we started hitting some impressive home runs. And in the first two years of our operation, we were already hitting 27% accuracy, which was outdoing the old Project Stargate by quite a bit. So one day, I'm, I'm at the Pentagon briefing the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, a three-star general. Remember, it was a joint operation between CIA and DIA. And here I'm sitting in the Pentagon of the office of the Director of Defense Intelligence Agency. Now, when you go to the Pentagon, you don't just walk in the front door. You've got to have a reason to be there. You have to be cleared to be there. And you have to have an escort to go in and go to where you're going. So. The general sent a young army major from his office to meet me at the door that I came in, and he escorted me to the general's office. I gave a briefing. Now, the briefing I gave had nothing to do with Project Stargate. It was an unrelated matter. 
What I thought it was interesting, the general assigned a guy, the, the major was in a full dress uniform, class A uniform, when he escorted me in, but he gives me a guy in a suit and tie to escort me back out of the Pentagon. And so we're walking, I don't know if you've ever been in the Pentagon, but it is a huge facility. It's enormous. And, you know, I'm being escorted by the guy now in the suit and tie, and on the way, we have a lot of time to talk. Turns out, he was a born-again believer. And I told him I was. I don't even remember how the subject came up, but we said something about the Lord, and the other responded and said, you know the Lord? Yes, I know the Lord. And we both got kind of excited. And he says to me, and I'm gonna, we're going to call him Jim. It's not his real name, but his name, he's an agent with the DIA. And Jim says to me, do you have time for coffee at Starbucks? There's, a, there's actually a Starbucks inside of pe the Pentagon. There's at least one, <laughs> maybe more. I said, sure. So Jim and I sat for two hours at the Starbucks at the Pentagon talking about the Lord. Now, in the conversation, I asked him what I asked that official earlier, have you heard of Project Stargate? And I asked, because I had this in my heart, I, God put it in my heart, that something terrible happened in our nation because we opened a gate. And so I'm asking a guy who's part of one of the two agencies that hosted and operated Project Stargate. He said, do you know about Stargate? And I said, yeah, it's declassified. I said, do you know about it? And he said, do I know about it? I was the official for the CIA that operated it. Now, that day, I was with him at the Pentagon. He had shifted over to DIA, but in the day of the Project Stargate, he was with the CIA. He was the lead manager for the lead agency that operated Project Stargate. And I'm sitting at Starbucks at the Pentagon with this guy. He had since then become a believer and had a boatload of regret, shame, and guilt for being part of a program that opened America up to the demonic realm. And he's telling me all these details. Now, here's what he said. He said, all the operators we're seeing these entities in the spirit world, but none of us in the room could see them but the operators that were strapped in the chairs. But something changed in December of 1972. He was in that building when one of those demonic powers, principalities, physically manifested in the room. Just, and not some apparition of some misty kind of, am I seeing this or not? No, as real as you and I are, this demonic entity, a principality, a ruling principality in the earth, manifest in front of everybody and scared the pants off of everybody in the room, including Jim. And this thing, as he said, was eight to nine feet tall. He said it was so horrific, and when Jim was telling me this, remember this happened in 1972. Well, I'm meeting with him in probably 2002, so years later, he's still trembling over the experience. Here's what he said. He said, we did a deal with that principality. He said, we made a covenant with that principality that if it would give us an advantage over the Russians and give us more power for remote viewing, astral projection techniques, for intelligence gathering purposes, we would give that principality rights over America. That day, December 
of 1972 was the point on the timeline of American history when Satan got its greatest advantage because a covenant was made. Do you see that? So things began to get dark in America at that point. You know what the next thing that happened in America was just one month later? January the 22nd, 1973, abortion was legalized in America through the decision of Roe versus Wade. One month after the covenant was made with this principality of darkness. You see, because all covenants have to be activated by blood sacrifice. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to shed that blood because that blood became the most powerful covenant. And so I think that abortion in America became the first down payment and installment of innocent blood to seal and activate a covenant that our government made with that principality and power. And from that moment, everything went darker and darker and darker. It's when child trafficking began to get traction in America. But the good news is Jesus' blood provided a better covenant, a more powerful covenant. Amen? That's our hope as a nation that through the blood of Jesus and by the covenant our founding fathers made with God in our beginning, we can believe that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than the sacrifices sealing and activating a demonic covenant. See? Because innocent blood is always required to open up the demonic it wasn't just the God of Moloch of the Old Testament that required the blood of children. It was all the pagan gods. They had that one thing in common. They demanded the blood of little ones. And I realize we've got a few running around in here tonight, so I'm going to be careful what I say. But then later, my wife and I went to Africa. We began serving the Lord, taking the gospel into unreached parts of West Africa. And I learned through the witchcraft culture of West Africa that when uh, a witch or witch doctor wants to dedicate a piece of land to Satan and set up a sacrificial altar, the first thing they want to do is get blood into the ground. Because in that covenant, they've got to make a sacrifice of blood in order to get the favor of that demon of the land. You see that? So... All this is to say we're dealing with a covenant that darkness made. When I'm having this conversation with Jim, he's almost in tears at Starbucks at the Pentagon just talking about it, shaking, physically shaking. And I said, well, Jim, let me just give you a little encouragement. The United States government that employed you and you managed the very program of tapping into dark entities like you did, asked me to head up a righteous version of what Project Stargate was intended to accomplish but using righteous prophetic voices. And you know what? It was like a boatload of guilt and shame lifted off of Jim's shoulders to know that there was a redemptive plan of God that had been implemented, that he had done some bad things being a part of this, making the deal with the devil in 1972, but to realize that God loves America so much that he would give America another chance. How many of you know God's the God of second chances? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be here tonight if he weren't. And he, not just the second chance, but third, fourth. I mean, the, it goes on and on, right? See? 
That's why I believe our best days in America are still ahead of us. And so one day in 2000, uh, around 2003, 2004, I realize in prayers, I'm praying over America, and our Project Morningstar uh, team had been functioning. By the way, we stopped terrorist attacks from happening that you never will know about because of the prophetic voices of those on our team. I mean, I'll, I will give you one example. Shortly after the attack of 9-11, our little team started working in the year 2002. The whole airline industry in America was just in recovery mode, trying to get, nobody wanted to fly. And, and the whole airline industry was in great distress. Well, one of the team members, who's one of the no-name persons on the team, she is a nurse down in a town in Texas. I had tried to recruit her pastor, who didn't feel called to be a part of the team, but he said this to me. He said, there's a lady in my church that I've never heard her miss it prophetically. And I said, I recommend you recruit her. And I did. I recruited her, brought her onto the team. She's a nurse, just a simple, godly woman. And one day I get a call from her, and she said, Don, the Lord showed me something that is about to happen, a terrorist attack that some guys are going to sabotage an American Airlines flight by putting a bomb on board. And it's going to be done through maintenance personnel that have access to the plane. And she said, here is the flight number. It leaves Dallas, Texas, DFW Airport. The destination is Paris de Gaulle Airport. It's going to leave in three days. When she said three days, I'm kind of in a panic because I need more lead time than that to get anything done, really. She knew the flight number, and I, I recognized it immediately because flight numbers often stay the same of regularly flown routes. So the Dallas to De Gaulle flight, I think it's flight 48, it's the same. And she knew the flight or the time of departure to the minute from DFW Airport, which is impossible. I mean, I flew up here from Dallas to Nashville, and my flight was 20 minutes late. Who knows the exact minute? Not even the airlines. She knew the exact minute of departure from DFW. She said, middle Atlantic, across the Atlantic, it will blow up, and everybody on board will die. And she said, God showed it to me in a dream. Don't ever underestimate the validity and the power of a dream or a vision. And so I get all this information from this lady. I write it up in a report. Our team had functioned enough to that point that when I filed a report through my chain of command, it was always tagged experimental program, but we had hit enough home runs by that time that everything I filed from that point was an actionable report. The FBI rolled on that information and discovered the plan exactly as she described and stopped it from happening. So, another home run. So one day, around 2003 or 2004, I realized, wait a minute, it's good that God's raised up this righteous version of the old Project Stargate, but whoever, who's ever closed the original gate that was opened? And the Lord said, well, I'll give you three guesses. You're in charge of the official United States government program. You are asked to show what it looks like for a righteous prophetic voice into civil government that can keep the nation safe. See. George Bush, I don't know what your opinion is of President Bush. I had the privilege of serving seven of his eight years in office. I was with President Bush in times of prayer and worship. 
when there were no TV cameras around. I saw President Bush worshiping God. I've heard him pray when nobody's around. The media is not around. He had a relationship with God. He had a sincere desire to keep America safe. Now, he blundered in a lot of different ways. Probably one of the blunders is approving or signing off on the Patriot Act, when it ended up costing a lot of our liberties. But it was out of a good heart, I think, for President Bush to keep America safe. He made a vow that America will never get attacked like this again, like we were attacked on 9-11. Some people ask me, don't you think George Bush was behind the attack of 9-11? No, I do not, and I'm going to tell you why. You remember the picture of President Bush on the secure telephone in the school where he was speaking to the children? Andy Card, his chief of staff, comes in. You see a picture of Andy bent over telling the president we are under attack. And you see that shocked look on President Bush's face. They escorted Bush right from that moment into a secure room in that school where they'd already set up a secure phone. And I got a picture of him on that phone. Guess who he was calling? He was calling the attorney general named John Ashcroft at that time. John Ashcroft was a spirit-filled Assembly of God pastor serving as the Attorney General. I know somebody that was in Attorney General Ashcroft's office the minute that call came from the President. Here's what, here's what President Bush says to John Ashcroft. He says, John, we're under attack. Please pray right now. Now, if Bush had been complicit and had knowledge of an inside job, he wouldn't be calling the Attorney General asking for prayer. Now, that's not to say there were peop not people in the government near the President that could have been involved. But I'm just saying, President Bush, I believe, had just enough depth in the Lord that his desire to keep America safe was a good intention and motive. Amen? Amen. So, you know, that's, that's another rabbit to chase into the forest at another time. But that's my opinion, okay, is I believe he was not knowledgeable. I think he was manipulated. He was used. But anyway... Long story short, so I decided, the Lord speaking to me says, you need to take your team to Washington and close the gate of Project Stargate. You're official. You're heading up the righteous version of what the U.S. government attended, uh, uh, intended to accomplish. So guess what? I got the, the team and we all flew to Washington. It was a couple of years later when we did it, but we flew to Washington, had reserv a reservation in a hotel right off of Capitol Hill, and we had a location right across from the Supreme Court. For three days, we were going to go into prayer and worship. And so we're all in the room. Brother Jim Hodges was there, and uh, I can't remember if Dutch was there, but several, uh, most of the team were present. So we arrive, and we go into this meeting on Friday night, 7 o'clock. We're not going to leave till Sunday afternoon. Everything should always begin with worship. That's why we had worship tonight. Right. Everything should start with worship and end with worship. Especially if you're dealing with civil government matters, you better have gone to the Lord in prayer and worship first. So when we got there, we immediately went into worship. Right on the dot, 7 o'clock. We're not going to pray. Nobody's going to pray a prayer. We're just going to worship God. We're going to come into the presence of his majesty. And we did. At 8, 12 p.m., I felt something lift. I felt the burden lift. I felt the mission got accomplished. And nobody had prayed one prayer. We're still in worship. And I look over at my wife and said, honey, did you just feel a moment ago something shifted? She says, yes, I felt something shifted and changed, and I felt like the Lord said mission has been accomplished. 
and we started asking people in the room, Greg, we said, did you, f everybody agreed, something at 8, 12 p.m. happened so much to the measure that we felt the mission had been accomplished and we could all go home. And not one single prayer had been prayed. But all, all of our tickets were still to leave on Sunday afternoon and nobody wanted to spend the change fees. To, so we spent the whole weekend in worship. So Saturday morning, we wake up, somebody brings me a copy of the Washington Times newspaper. That was back when newspapers were still being printed, right? Guess what it says on the front page? Last night at 8.15 p.m., the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Porter Goss, and his top two deputy directors resigned at Langley headquarters. You see, because the worship brought us into a place where we were able to disturb darkness that had been in place by a demonic covenant, and that was changing the hierarchy of leadership at the, the primary agency that operated Project Stargate, the CIA. Now, the director of CIA is a cabinet position appointed by the president. Now, I always liked Porter Goss as a director of CIA. I didn't, never met him, but I kind of liked the guy. You know, because some of those guys are pretty dark. But I always liked Porter. And if you're a cabinet member and are appointed by the president, you don't send your resignation over to the White House on Friday night which is what he and his top two deputies did. They didn't even walk it over there or take it by car. They sent it by messenger or courier, classified courier. You wait till Monday morning and you walk it into the president's office. If he hired you, you, you resigned to him in person, right? But that wasn't the case. They sent their resignations over. Now, there's a picture of President Bush and Porter Goss on Monday. Do we have it? There they are. This is President George W. Bush. White House photographer snapped this picture when Porter Goss, this guy on the left, is now officially in the presence of the president resigning. And I can tell you, neither of these gentlemen are very happy at that moment. So something that happened in worship disturbed the hierarchy of evil so that shook up the whole upper level of leadership at Langley CIA headquarters. And you can't convince me that our time of worship didn't do something to close Project Stargate. And here's how I know, because God gave us a confirmation that it had happened because one of the ladies on our team, a lady named Teresa, that was with us when it happened in Washington, she is in Dallas, Texas, in a prophetic meeting, and a prophet, and I don't even know who the guy is, He's preaching on a Sunday night, and Teresa's on the back row listening to this prophet who stops his preaching and says, i got to tell everybody the story of something that happened. He said, I have a good friend that's a manager at CIA at Langley. He, he's a born-again, spirit-filled believer, and he manages 30 Central Intelligence Agency employees. And he says, he sends me messages to come to Washington every so often, and I go to the headquarters, and I minister to his 30 employees, prophetically. He said he only does it a, a, a time or two a year, but he said, I got a call from him just a few days ago. And he said, get on the plane as soon as you can and get to Washington and come out to Langley. Something's happened at CIA. And he goes, well, what's the rush? I mean, why is it so urgent? And, and the, the, the guy at CIA is telling this prophet, he says, we don't know, but some guy brought a team of specialized intercessors to Washington to shut Project Stargate down. 
I'm almost thankful he didn't know my name. He just said some guy. But he said, since that moment, everything has begun to change in the atmosphere at CIA. So that was the way the Lord chose to let us know that the gate had been shut. Now here's the thing, is the gate was shut, but any good rancher will tell you if the cows got out the gate, you got to still go and get them back in to the pasture and close the gate. So what we're dealing with today is darkness that flooded in by a covenant, by our government, through an open gate that though it be shut at that time, possibly, I believe it was, we're still now having to round up the cattle and get them back at, into the right pasture. But uh, my point is, God has given you and I more authority than we think. And it cost Jesus his blood for him to call you a king and a priest. That's who we are. We didn't ask for that, but the first five chapters of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, this is one of the first things the Apostle John hears said. Remember, he said, write down what you hear and see. And one of the first things John the Apostle hears in Revelation chapter 1 is all about your identity as priest and king. We are both priest and king under the Lord. Now, there was a teaching that kind of went around for a while years ago that, that, that talked about, well, people in the business marketplace are kings and the rest of us are priests. I don't think that's the way it really is. I think we are both priest and king. We walk in a dual identity as priest and king, right? And then in Revelation 5, he repeats the same thing to John. And this time he adds, you are kings and priests and you will reign on the earth. And guess what? That's not talking about some millennium in the future. It's in the present tense in the Greek. You're going to rule in the earth right now. So your authority is operational for you right now in the earth to even stop wars that are out of season. Amen? So, see, God's just trying to find some people to believe this. Because the more you believe in the authority you have been given by blood of the king of all kings, the more you will operate in that authority. Because you can have all the authority in the world, but if you don't know you have it, you can never operate in it. So another time in Washington, a colleague uh, and I had to go and brief a colonel at probably one of the most secure military facilities outside of Washington. In fact, you had to pass through six security checkpoints from the public road from the time you pulled into the facility off the public road till the time we got to the colonel's office we had to go through six security checkpoints. We had to pull our ID out at each checkpoint. So we're, it's taken us a half hour just to get through security. That's how secure this facility was. I pull out my credential, my buddy, my colleague would pull out his, and usually it was a sergeant or somebody, it was a military facility, so it was Army guys, uh, MPs, and they would, they would run our credentials through the computer, they'd hand them back, thank you, sir, you can pass. And we just worked our, worked our way through the process. We get to the last security guy right outside the colonel's building, and I'm handing, I hand him mine, and Bill hands him his. He looks at Bill's, he runs it through the computer, he hands it back to Bill, thank you, sir, uh, you're, you're clear. But he hadn't handed me mine back yet. And he kept, I'm looking at this sergeant behind the computer in front of where he's at, but I can't see the screen, right? But he's staring at the screen, and he looks puzzled. <laughs> and I said, Sergeant, is there a problem? 
I thought there was a problem with my credentials. Though none of the other guys caught any problem, you know, it, it would have been hit and, and revealed on the first checkpoint, right? If there was a problem. He said, no, sir, I'm sorry for the delay. He said, we just don't see this very often. And I said, what do you mean, Sergeant? He said this, and he pointed to a little holographic image on my ID. He said, we don't see this level of clearance very often. And I said, oh, yeah. I played along. I didn't have a clue. But embedded in that hologram was information about my clearances that I didn't even know were there. And I said, it's okay, Sergeant. I understand. You don't, hear, you don't see those very often. He said, we really don't. He said, here, you're cleared, sir. Sorry for the delay. And he salutes. And we go in and have our meeting with the colonel. And I'm going in, and, I'm, and the Lord's saying, did you notice? He saw clearance and access that you didn't even know you had. And you have been given the highest clearances to have the greatest access by the blood of the king of all kings. Amen? Use your authority. Don't just sit on it. Use it. Because the world is waiting to see a demonstration of true, real-world, real-time authority of the ecclesia. And it, let me just tell you, don't make the mistake of saying, oh, that's just what Don does. Uh-uh. Well, listen, I just stumble forward doing the best I can. You and I are both deputized, officialized, and authorized by heaven. So start believing not just who God is in you, but who you are in God. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Amen. Did I send any other pictures? One more, maybe? I like this one. <laughs> Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu knows what time it is. He's a modern-day David. He's not perfect, but neither was David. David blew it big time. This man is not perfect. He makes mistakes. But guess what? He knows what time it is. He's a master strategist. Now, I want to pray for you tonight, but before I do, let me talk about Israel for just a moment. I love Israel. You know why? Because God loves Israel. But you know what he loves even more than Israel? He loves his covenant with Israel. The Abrahamic covenant. Our hope for America is not because God just loves us so much he can't not help us. He loves his covenant. Israel is in a covenant with God. But the holy land is not the holy land you think it is. Yeah, right. It's just not. And let me just say, please don't think that I'm anti-Israel because nobody loves Israel more than I do. I've been there, briefed them. I can't tell you his name, the guy that I'm going to talk about, but I can tell you he's the head guy. <clears throat> I'm in his office in Jerusalem. He's got Mossad. He's got all these officials from Israel in his room. There were probably a dozen of us in this room. And I'm there to give a briefing. He's sitting to my right, and he's introducing me. And here's how he introduced me. He said, gentlemen, this is Don Crum, my good friend, and a good friend of Israel. And then he said, listen to everything he says. It was probably the highest compliment I've ever received on this earth by a human being. But don't be romantically infatuated by the nation of Israel. And I'm concerned because I know Christians that are just so in love with Israel. But I'm going to tell you, God loves his covenant. 
because Israel, listen to this, is 85% atheist and agnostic. That's a fact. 85% of the nation of Israel's population either don't believe in God or not sure if he even really exists. Only 15% of the population of Israel are what they would call religious, but that includes all religions, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and all the other isms. 15%. And only one, no, one to two percent, one and a half percent of the nation of Israel's population are what you and I would call Christian. They would call messianic. Why would God care about a nation that was only 1.5% believers in him other than the fact he loves his covenant? And you and I should love his covenant with Israel. Amen? Amen? Because the consequences of not blessing Israel can be catastrophic. He said, if somebody curses Israel, I will curse them. What we're seeing happen and unfold in the Middle East right now is the ancient Persian Empire, which is modern Iran, being judged by the God who's a keeper of covenant. And it's not about this guy making all the right decisions or the fact he's just so in love with the people of Israel, but because he loves his covenant. So we need to get our heads screwed on straight about Israel and stop being so romantically infatuated with the nation of Israel. Be in love with the God of covenant who's in an active covenant with Israel. Because the Bible says if you offend Israel, it's like touching the pupil of his eye or the apple of his eye. You know what that means in the Hebrew? If you offend Israel, it's like poking your finger in the eye of God. Ouch. The president of Iran made the terrible mistake years ago of making a public statement internationally that he was, he believed that they were going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The president of Iran. And he said, we're going to do everything we can to destroy Israel. Well, you know what he was doing? He was poking his finger in the eye of God. You know, interesting thing happened. You can verify this on the internet if you want. September the 9th, 2009, the Iranian military are doing their, their annual military parade like the Russians do in Moscow where they roll the tanks down Red Square and the missiles and, you know, and the North Koreans do the same thing. They, they're doing a demonstration of their military might and prowess. The Iranians do the same thing every year. So on September the 9th, 2009, they have their own Iranian military parade an air show there in Tehran. And they've got their fighters up flying around. They're, they're doing this massive show of their military strength. Now, at that time, Iran had three airplanes called AWACS. Any of you that have served in military know what an AWACS is. It's actually an acronym that means Airborne Early Warning and Control System. The U.S. Air Force has a whole bunch of them. They're the big, most of them are pretty sizable planes that have the flat radar dish that spins around. Let me tell you, that's more than just an airborne radar system. That is a, a major command operational platform that can gain intelligence, not just see blips on a radar, but can intercept what we call signal intelligence of, of the enemy and then communicate to ground commanders what those AWACS are intercepting. Very important in any military to have AWACS. And again, the United States has a bunch. Ar Iran had three. Russian made, bought by the Iranians. One of them wasn't functioning, and so they robbed the parts off of the broken one to maintain the two that were still flyable. So now they got one of their two AWACS airborne 
doing circles in the pattern, showing off their abilities. The other last AWACS is sitting at the end of the runway waiting for clearance to take off because what they wanted to do is get them both flying around to kind of show the world. We've got, you know what we call AWACS in military? Eyes in the skies. Well, as number two AWACS is sitting, waiting for the tower to give them clearance to take off, an F-5 fighter, Iranian fighter, happens to get out of the pattern and runs in to the airborne AWACS mid-air collision that rains the debris down onto the second and last AWACS still setting at the end of the runway. That happened September the 9th, 2009. In other words, when the president of Iran poked his finger in the eye of God. You know what God did on that day? He poked the two eyes of the Iranian Air Force plumb out. God's, God's kind of serious about this. But again, not because it's the holy land. Now, I love the tourists. You know, I've seen some of the tours and been to the site. I love that. But it's not holy the way you think it is, it's 85% atheist and agnostic. Another story of just how God intervenes on behalf of Israel, which should give us hope and faith that he's going to intervene for America. Because he's a keeper of covenant. We might break our side of the covenant, but a covenant is a two-way proposal. And you should be glad that God keeps his side of your, your covenant with him even when you blow it and break your side. So part of my job, my day job, uh, was, uh, is kind of a mouthful, counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So 22 years I've served have had primarily to do with keeping the biggest, baddest weapons out of the hands of the biggest, baddest regimes including Iran and Syria and other Middle Eastern nations. And, and my team has been uh, operational in monitoring the North Korea weapons sales to Iran, right? So we picked up chatter, intercepted signal intelligence that Iran was doing a buy of two nuclear warheads already ready to shoot from Pyongyang, North Korea. And our folks intercepted the tail numbers of the two airplanes that were gonna fly from Pyongyang to Tehran to deliver these two warheads. We had the tail numbers of the planes, we had the transponder codes, which is an electronic signature that identifies a plane. The Chinese gave North Korea permission to fly through Chinese airspace to deliver those two warheads to Iran, who was intending to use those to destroy the nation of Israel. One was determined to use, be used against Jerusalem, the other Tel Aviv. Both of those nuclear ICBM type missiles had enough ordnance and firepower to completely destroy the entire nation of Israel. So we're tracking the business deal as well as the transportation of these two nuclear devices. So I get on a plane and I go to Israel because I have specific information I think the Israelis would like to know. I'm assuming they already know because the Mossad knows everything basically going on. I assume that they knew about the sale of the two nuclear warheads. They already had the rockets, the missiles ready in Tehran. All it was going to be was bolting on the warheads to the missiles they were going to shoot into Israel. So I get into this meeting, and I mention the two warheads, and the Mossad guy in the room goes, what did you just say? I said the two warheads that North Korea sold to Iran that were just delivered a few days ago. He said, tell us more. They did not know. <laughs> the guys that are supposed to know everything happening on the planet didn't know. God, 
gave me an opportunity to fill in the blanks for Israel because here's what happened. This is powerful. There's an organization of shofar blowers. Did you know that? International Organization of Shofar Blowers. The Lord speaks to them, and they schedule everybody in the organization to blow their shofar at a certain time on November the 11th, 2011, so that somewhere in the world a shofar was being blown to praise the Lord on 11-11 of 11. And none of them understood why. Then I came to know a, a powerful, wonderful Chinese guy in Los Angeles who the Lord spoke to to gather Chinese and Korean Christians in Los Angeles at the big stadium on 11-11-11 to pray. And they didn't know why. So shofars are blowing for the 24-hour period of 11-11-11, not knowing why we're doing it. The Chinese and the Koreans are filled in a stadium in Los Angeles praying during that same period, and guess what happened? Those two nuclear bombs or warheads that were being bolted onto Iranian-made missiles suddenly got exploded in underground bomb-proof bunkers. They had separated them to two underground facilities several miles outside of Tehran. They were deep in this, these underground facilities being readied for launch against Israel. There were North Korean missile technicians, Russian missile technicians, a whole lot of Iranian technicians down there getting these things ready. Somehow, Israel, based on the information I shared with them, went in there and exploded both of those. You can look at it on the internet, and the cover story they trotted out was, and there's pictures showing smoke plumes coming out of the desert, and those were the deep underground bunkers going up. But the cover story was Iranian uh, news had to come up with something to tell the people because of this smoke coming out of the desert. They said, oh, it was just a little ac accident in an ammunition depot. But it was God dealing judgmentally against the prince of Persia, which is what Netanyahu is doing tonight. It's not about Hamas. It's not about Hezbollah. Those are surface actors that are being used by the ancient prince of Persia. And thank God that America is still standing on the side of Israel, not because they do everything right, but because God still has an active covenant with the nation of Israel. And you better pray that one stroke of the president's pen in the Oval Office does not shift and change everything and flip this where we're not on Israel's side. It's just, it would be tragic. And it could happen. But God forbid. Amen? All right, so. I've given you a lot of information tonight. Probably more than I have any other group anywhere I've talked. And hopefully I don't get a phone call from the FBI <laughs> who are tuned in. But that's okay, because I didn't violate any agreement. I told you what we call open source media information. Most everything I told you tonight you can find on the Internet, with the exception of the entity that showed up at Fort Meade at Project Stargate. Now, you're not going to find that because Jim... Jim told me about it, but I think God had him share that whole thing with me for his own sake to be forgiven and cleansed and unburdened from carrying that all these years, but also so that I could help teach and share the ecclesia where we got to the mess we're at and why. Do you understand how important that is? 
that we understand the timeline of where darkness gained an advantage. Because if you know the timeline, you can pray and close gates that were opened by a demonic covenant. So we need to hear the backstory. You need to understand how God deals with nations and how committed he is to America, and may he continue to be. But how committed he is to Israel because he loves his covenant with both nations. You see, God's going to deal. He's dealing with Iran right now. He's dealing with an ancient Persian principality. You see, it's a bloodline issue. That's why God told Saul, you go in and kill all of the Amalekites. Don't even leave a child or animals alive. You know why? Not because God's got some kind of split personality, wakes up someday in a bad mood and says, go wipe out a whole nation. No, because he is committed to a covenant with his people to deal with a bloodline and an agenda that has poked its finger in the eye of God by saying Israel has no right to exist. So I'm looking at Netanyahu, and I'm going, he knows what time it is. And he's not going to stop, nor should he. And if you just don't have the stomach for that, I'm sorry. But Saul was told to destroy all the Malachites. He did not obey the Lord. He spared King Agag and the best of the animals and probably some other stuff. And later, when Saul would be wounded in a battle, he tries to commit suicide because he sees the enemy coming. He doesn't want them to make sport of him. So he's trying to fall on his own weapon and kill himself, and he can't do it. So he sees a young guy standing over there, and he goes, come here. The kid comes running over, and he, the, the boy sees that it's the king. And the king orders him, use my weapon and kill me before the enemy makes sport of me. And you know what the kid does? He kills King Saul. David is so upset. Later, he calls that that young man be brought before him. He is interrogating him. Who are you? He said, I am the son of an Amalekite. He was a descendant of the very bloodline that God was trying to deal with through Saul earlier on. The principle is the thing you spare is going to be the thing that's going to trip you up at, at some point. Amen. That's what the Lord's doing in Israel. He's dealing with the bloodline. He, had to, he was doing this against Hezbollah. Let, let me just say this. When I came into government, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I need you to understand how committed I am to my covenant with Israel. And I'm going, okay. And he said, no, you, you don't understand. He said, I'm going to use you to stop wars that are out of season to save and protect Israel. I'll go, okay. And he said, I'm so committed to my covenant with a nation of Israel that I'm going to deal judgmentally against all of its enemies. And here's what he said. I'll never forget it because it shook me up. He said, I will rock the Iraqis. I'll rain on the Iranians. I'm going to sear the Syrians, and if I have to, I'm going to roast a turkey <laughs> in order to protect a nation I have a covenant with. Well, guess what? He's rocked the Iraqis. He's getting ready to rain on the Iranians. Damascus in Syria will be destroyed. And guess what happened in Turkey the other day, in case you missed it on the news? A member of the Turkish parliament gets up to the po podium and he calls Allah in front of the world to deal with Israel. And he falls dead of a heart attack. Right on TV. Listen, we're going to see more of that. We're going to see enemies of God fall dead right in front of everybody. It's going to be like the Anaya, uh, Seraphi and Anias kind of moment. 
It has to be. You see, in America, this year, 2024, is going to be the most turbulent of all. You know why? Because the Democrats, maybe there are a few here, probably a lot online, they have to do something to stay in power. They have to. They're not going to give up power because they know we're going to take back the House, the Senate, and the White House. And they're not willing to let it happen. And no matter what they have to create to stop it, they're going to do it. Or they're going to try. We have authority to preempt all unrighteous actions that will tamper with the destiny of America. We are going to see America rise again. The eagle that has fallen shall be placed back upon our nation. Not to restore national pride. I pray that our nation would always be in a place that we're humble and broken because our best, the best days come out of our brokenness. Amen? So let me pray for you. I think I'm out of time. You know how I can tell it's time? When I, I preach till I get hungry. And I'm starting to get there. I know. I know. I'm just a long-winded preacher. That's what I am. But if, if I could just have the privilege of praying for you tonight. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I've shared a lot with you because I believe you're mature leaders. And you can handle it. You can take it. And you know what to do with it. Right? Amen. Yeah, you can go ahead and play a little bit. <sighs> two anointings with the two identities that the Lord has given us as king and priest. We need both. Not either or, but both. We, in fact, we need an increased portion of the priestly anointing, which is what brings us into the intimacy with the Lord. The priestly was established to minister to God. And that's our first calling is to minister to the Lord, to love him with all of our hearts. The priestly always goes first. And then the kingly comes when God responds to our priestly ministry to him by trusting us with great authority to bring his plan into place. So we need both. We need the strength and power of the kingly, but we also need the passion and humility of the priestly and guess what? The two balance each other very well. I need the humility of the priestly to counterbalance the strength and authority of the kingly. But the priestly without the kingly can be anemic and not get the job done. See, I tend to lean toward the priestly because I love to worship, I love to pray, and those are two priestly functions. I could stay in here all night praising God, worshiping, because that's my propensity is to lean toward the priestly. But if I do that, I never come out and go out there to operate in the kingly. And the Lord needs us to be kings to get the job done and the mission accomplished. So we need both, right? So one day I was in Washington, this was in 2005. I can't tell you the man's name, but you'd recognize it if I said it. I'm on a non-disclosure agreement, can't say him by name. And I would meet with him and give him briefings there in Washington, and he would always ask me the same thing. When we finished the briefing, he would look across his desk and he would say, Don, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about something more important. And you gotta understand, the things we talked about were very important. But he said to me, has the Lord told you anything to tell me? Let's go to the more important things. And I would usually, I'm not a prophet, but usually I'd have some prophetic word of encouragement. And the Lord had given me such a word for him that day. And get the picture, we're in his office, he's behind his desk, and I'm in a chair in front of his desk. The door, which was kind of interesting, his door's always closed, except that day it was wide open. Chief of Staff's office right down the hall, there's bomb sniffing dogs being walked through the hallways by the Capitol Police and the Secret Service. It was quite a picture. 
And I said, he said, what did the Lord tell you? And he, I said, sir, I believe the Lord showed me that like David received three separate kingly anointings in his lifetime, God's ready to give you your third dose of a kingly anointing. And I gave a Sunday school les lesson to him. I said, David was a successful king in Israel because he had received all three anointings, proved himself faithful to carry the first portion and the second portion, which qualified him to receive the third when he became king over all of Israel. He's listening to me, and he pushes his chair back. Now, I remember hitting it crash against the crescendo, or the, what is it called? Crescent, what? Credenza, the credenza behind his desk. His chair hit it kind of hard. The pictures on the credenza kind of shook a little. He stands up and puts his hands up toward the ceiling of this beautiful office and shouts, let me have it. I almost hit the deck to take cover because of who he was, and I knew Secret Service were right outside the door, and I didn't want to get hit by the first rounds out of their MP5 rifles, machine gun. But it happened so quick, I didn't do anything. I was stunned. He's got his hands lifted, his eyes are closed, face to the ceiling, and he's saying, let me have it. And keeps standing there, waiting. I stood up respectfully as I could, walked around his desk, and I laid my hand on his tie. Blue, beautiful blue tie. And you know, in those moments, you want to pray a good prayer, an impressive prayer, powerful prayer. It didn't come out. I fumbled with my words, and I just blurted out, God, let him have it. And then I'm really looking for Secret Service guys to come busting down the hallway I watched him receiving his third anointing of the kingly anointing and when the power of God hit him he fell back into the chair thank God the chair was still behind him he falls into the chair with his hands still lifted his eyes were still closed I'm standing there waiting for him to come to so I could say goodbye I'm looking at my watch. I had somewhere else I needed to be. I'm looking at him. He's not budging. He's under the anointing of the kingly. So I slip out of his office and close the door behind me, leaving him in his chair in the presence of God. It was amazing. I watched him receive his third kingly anointing. Tonight, the Lord wants to give you your next measure of the kingly anointing. You're going to need it more than you think you do for 2024. So three weeks later, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri to meet with that, that government official to give him a follow-up briefing to the briefing I gave him that day in Washington. <clears throat> he was giving a speech at the, at the convention center on Veterans Day. I go, they show me into the backstage area. They had secured a room, a little small room, for he and I to have a quick meeting. They escorted him off the platform direct into that room with me. I gave him a five minute updated briefing and we said goodbye and his guys took him to their car, his car. We were both parked in a secure area but still was kind of open. And I had a guy that escorted me to our car and about the time we got to our car I hear Don Don and I'm looking around going who on earth even knows I'm here but who's calling me out by name and I look and it's him and right before he gets in the back seat of the car he's saying Don I said yes sir <laughs> you should have seen those Secret Service guys they were almost pushing him in the back seat. He said, the king's anointing that I received in my office three weeks ago. Remember? 
Yes, sir. I remember. <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, my life has never been the same. And then he said, I've gotten more done in government in the last three weeks under that increase of a king's anointing than in my entire political career. And every single time I saw him after that, he always refers to that day, Greg. Remember, Don? Remember that day? Yes, sir, I remember. Believe me, I'll never forget it. He said, remember that day when everything changed. <clears throat> Stand with me in the presence of his majesty tonight. Father, for a whole new season, we're calling the year 2024. I believe you don't want us leaving this old year with the same anointing going into a new year that just might be the most challenging of all years. But I believe, God, you want to pour out a fresh oil. Like David said, I'm anointed with fresh oil. A new measure of the kingly anointing and the priestly anointing. And I'm asking, God, that you open heaven over us in this moment and that you begin to pour the oils of both the priestly and the kingly upon all of us, including myself. So right now, be as hungry as he was in Washington when he shouted, let me have it! <laughs> and out of an open heaven, the oils are coming down. The finest and the best of heaven the king's anointing from the king of all kings, from the Lord of all lords. He's making a rich, increased deposit into each one of us tonight of both the priestly and the kingly for a whole new season. Come on, take it, take it right now, receive it. God is commissioning you into a new year and a new season but not to go into this new season empty-handed or even under the same measures of anointing that you've operated in this year. God says, increase cometh from the Lord now for a new season, for a new day, from even the most resistance and the greatest opposition, you're going to tactically advance because of the king's anointing. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray you, you would use each one of us in our assignments this year. That assignments unfinished will be finished now. That missions will now be accomplished and completed. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit through us. That God, you would even stop wars that are out of season. That you preempt darkness from, from having an advantage. Lord, we decline, we decline all opportunities of darkness that would prevail against us in this hour. And we break an assignment of darkness against America tonight and against Israel. Lord, we pray that you roll back accusation and attack of darkness, roll it right back onto the enemy's head. I pray that the, the devourer will be devoured from this night forward. So Lord, I bless all of my brothers and sisters here tonight. I thank you that you convened us here, not as a congregation, but as a Congress. The most authoritative body called the Ecclesia. And I bless my dear brother, Greg, Dr. Greg Hood and Joanne. I pray, God, that everything you have put in this man's heart, you would accomplish, not by his might, nor by his power, but by your spirit. And I pray, make it so, Father. Unto your glory, for your name's sake, forever and ever, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you.